Hey everyone, Tim Alatori here, Principal Architect with Domum, and today we're back talking about ADUs. This is our question and answer video, our first of possibly many. As you continue to submit questions, we will continue to answer them. Also, we've talked with a number of you on the phone, and uh, a number of you have purchased our ADU plans and our book, Inside the Mind of an Architect. You know, if you like our plans, our book, our videos, anything that we do, it really does help us. We're a referral business, and so if you leave a comment, you like, you subscribe, any of those things really help us. Uh, that's that's how we stay in business. We don't run a whole lot of ads, and uh, it's pretty much just word of mouth. People like us, and they share, and they, and uh, that's how we keep going. So today I have a list of questions that you have submitted and I'm going to just go through these and we'll answer them. We'll take them one by one. If there's something I leave out, if you think I'm wrong on something, or if there's another question you have, feel free to drop it into the comments below or send us an email. Also, you can schedule a call with a member of our team if you go to domum.design slash schedule. And if you're interested in buying one of our pre-designed ADU plans, you can go to shop.domum.design. We're also adding in there over the coming weeks garage conversion plans. We've heard from a lot of you that you're interested in that. So we have some that we've done and we're gonna put those up on there for you. Um, some other news as well, we're, um, we're constantly exploring and trying to find out how better to serve you and help you in your journey for creating an ADU or, or building in some other structure. And uh, there's a number of cities right now in the state that are allowing for uh, pre-approved ADU plans, plans that have actually gone through their systems and they're, they're ready to pull. So we're working with those cities trying to get plans approved. That way you can you know, pull permits in a much quicker fashion. And also there's some cities that are uh, implementing uh, different economic programs to help fund ADUs. So as we get more information on that, uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you get those updates. Okay, question number one. Uh, you said all three units could be rented, the primary, ADU, and JADU. I've seen other videos where they say the JADU must be owner-occupied if you have three units. Who is right? Well, uh, it depends. <laughs> My short answer is both of us. Um, the, the new laws that went into effect on January 1st, 2020, in particular Bill number 881, modified the owner occupancy requirements. So depending on when you're watching, like when the video is recorded that you're watching right now, we're, re we're recording in May of 2020. And um, depending on when that was recorded, the prior laws required certain owner occupancy for uh, one of the units. Now, Bill 881 eliminates the owner occupancy requirements through 2025, okay? So we're not sure exactly what's gonna happen in 2025, but right now there's no owner occupancy requirements, which opens up a lot of possibilities for rental income. Now, uh, it's possible that the laws will revert back or they'll go to some, some combination. Uh, prior to 2020, the uh, junior ADU had to be uh, occupied by a member of the family um, and or at least one of the, the units on the property had to be owner occupied until 2025 that has been removed. So again, subscribe because in 2025 or leading up to that, we'll give you some updates on this. Okay, question number two, can I have two bedrooms and two bathrooms in my ADU? Yes, you totally can. There's no limit or maximum number of bedrooms and bathrooms you can have in your ADU. There are minimum sizes for bedrooms and bathrooms established by the building code. And there's also limits on how many square feet your ADU can be and still be classified as an ADU. So for example, uh, on our website, we have a plan called Vanessa. It's a 1200 square foot ADU, which is the maximum uh, to be counted as an ADU. And that has a master bath, uh, master bedroom suite and a guest bedroom and a guest bath. And that ADU also has an attached garage. So it's a, basically another little two bedroom, two bath with a garage house, 1200 square feet, and it classifies as an ADU. Uh, it's a great plan. Uh, we've actually, uh, that one's been built and uh, it's a real nice little unit. Okay, number three, question three here. Hello, hello to you too. 
I have a question. Is there a minimum clearance between a primary dwelling unit and a detached ADU? Again, this is one of those it depends, yes and no type questions. There's a lot of variables that go into that. First and foremost, I would say your local jurisdiction can set minimum distances. Your local fire department, your fire marshal, can also Im impose additional restrictions on building separation. Uh, the building code gives a lot of leeway to local agencies to make requirements more stringent, and there's nothing in the new laws that prohibits uh, them from doing that when it comes to building separation. Now, when it comes to the building code, uh, there's also certain requirements that play into like maximum building, allowable areas, and fire ratings for walls and windows. Generally, we recommend keeping an ADU and a primary residence at least 10 feet away from each other. You don't get into all the restrictions for window openings and uh, firewalls, fire separation barriers and, and the like. But you can go uh, fairly tight. Uh, four to five feet is allowed and uh, you can now when you get to that close you are limited on how many windows you can have like the square footage you're going to probably end up with some you're going to end up with some fire rated walls maybe some tempered glazing uh, wired glazing rated doors you know there's a bunch of other things that kick in so we recommend 10 feet but uh, depending on your jurisdiction and what design you want to put in there you can go a lot closer uh, there's uh, another company we've been working with recently that's doing uh, ADUs or modularized ADUs and I'm not at liberty to talk about them yet. Maybe in a future video we'll, we'll spotlight them. But they have pre-designed units that actually have solid walls on the perimeter. They have windows in the front and the back. And so having those solid fire rated walls allows them to come up really close to the primary residence. Question number four. What are... Okay, this question is actually a three-part question. So stick with me here. I'm going to get through them all. One, what are impact fees? Two, also, does the main ADU require a new address? And three, does it require its own gas electric water meters? Okay, I'll try to keep this brief because I could get really in depth on all these things. I'll actually go backwards and answer these. So first one, does it require its own gas electric and water meters? That depends on the local jurisdiction. Some municipalities, and it really comes down to the utility companies, uh, will require you to have separate utilities. Um, some will let you piggyback off the primary. So typically sewer is shared with the main residence. Uh, we haven't run into a case where an ADU required its own sewer connection. If you have an attached ADU that's connected to the main house, that is almost always shared gas, electric, water. If you go detached, we have run into cases where the electric companies have requested a second meter and panel or the cities have requested that. Um, we haven't run into a case where water and gas have been requested to be separated but again there might be cities and municipalities that we haven't worked with where that that could be required. There's a couple of pluses and minuses to that. You know when you do have your separate utility hookups you can simplify billing. You can have a separate billing for each of those units so if you have a tenant they just take care of their stuff. Um, if it's shared, oh, but then you have connection fees, right? If it's shared, you avoid extra connection fees, but billing and sharing costs is a little more tricky. Okay, going backwards, question part two. Uh, does the main ADU require a new address? That, again, is dependent on your local building department and, and their uh, requirements. And we've seen that go both ways as well. Uh, it sometimes is really nice to have its own address but if it has its own address, then you would most likely be required to have separate utility connections. Um, the uh, requirement for an address doesn't preclude you from creating your own sub-address for mailing purposes, right? So you could have your main address, let's say it's 555 Main Street, that's your primary house, you could call that A and call your ADU B, right? And you can have two mailboxes if your post office allows you, or just have it in one mailbox and you just know to share the mail. Okay, and then back to the first question, what are impact fees? So um, there's a couple type of fees that are charged when you build. So the first one I already talked about, those are utility connection fees, right? So so Southern California Edison or PG&E, whoever you have for your power, they're not going to come out and install a new meter and panel for free. Well, they don't install the panels, your electrical contractor would, but they're not going to install the meter for free, right? 
if they have to do a new transformer or something, they're going to charge you connection fees. Same thing for water and gas. Those um, are not affected by these new laws that went into effect in 2020. The second type of fees are building permit fees. And those would be things that are charged by your building department to review your plans, make sure they're code compliant, and have the inspectors come out and inspect the project during construction. Also kind of in that same category are entitlement fees that are charged by your planning department to make sure that what you're proposing meets with the local zoning ordinances. Okay, so all those fees you have to pay no matter what, they're not affected by the new laws. The last type are impact fees. So impact fees are fees charged by your local government for the impact your additional development will have on shared social services. So those could be transportation fees that maybe go into paying to maintain roads and, and supplement uh, bus service, park fees that help with maintenance of and building of parks, or school fees that go to the school district for the additional students that might potentially be going to your, uh, your schools there. So those are impact fees and those are waived under the new laws in 2020. Most municipalities for small projects already had some sort of uh, exception to those fees. Like uh, for example, in the Bay Area of, of Northern California, it's very common for developments under 500 square feet to not have to pay school fees. Um, but this is a blanket for all ADU development, 1200 square feet and less, where those, in, or I'm sorry, 800 square feet and less, where those impact fees are not uh, to be charged. Okay, did I get all three parts? I think so. Okay, quick glance from my producer. Yes. Okay, question five. Quick question. These laws, are they in effect in all of California, even San Bernardino County? And my answer to that is yes. Okay, question six. Let's say the original home is 1,008 square feet, but there is 4,000 square feet available in the back. Does the ADU have to be 800 square feet or 504 square feet in my case? Okay, so Bill 881 changed some of those requirements for allowable square footages. And if you go back to our uh, first video on the changes, we, we break this down and I drew a lot of stuff on the whiteboard and kind of outline this. Um, I know it can be a little confusing. So the answer to this is the general rule is your ADU can only be 50% the area of your primary residence. That's the maximum area. So in this case, the maximum area of your ADU would be 1,008 divided by two or 504 square feet, right? But that bill 881 also specifies a minimum square footage of an ADU that you're allowed. So in this case, the minimum that you're allowed is 800 square feet. So it's a little, it's a little confusing, I know because it says the maximum is 504, but your minimum is 800. Well, the minimum is what governs here. So even if your house is only 1,008 square feet, you're still entitled to an 800 square foot ADU. And you can pack a lot into 800 square feet or even 500 square feet. We have a plan on our website, uh, Julia. You can go check that one out. And that one is about 400 square feet and it's a, a nice little loft or a nice little suite. It's got a you know kitchen, living room, uh, bedroom, laundry room. You can put a lot into four or 500 square feet. Okay, question seven. Hello, hello to you. I was wondering if you can build a basement under an ADU that is separate from the house. Uh, yes, you can, uh, it's totally allowed. You could make that a junior ADU or a full ADU and it can be a, a separate entrance and you know, completely independent. Question eight, thank you for the information. You're welcome. That's not a question, it's a statement, but uh, we're actually having a lot of fun doing these. We've, we've spent a lot of time researching all of this and we, you know, we're always helping our clients go through this process and uh, you know, getting this information in your hands makes our job easier and whatever other architect or designer you work with makes our job easier too. Okay, here's the question. What if you already have an ADU that was built without permits? Is it easier now to get it approved? Okay, so we get asked this question all the time. <laughs> it, I know there's, there's kind of this stigma out here in the world about how complicated it is to get permits. And if you don't have a good system in place and the right team, getting permits can be very complicated and expensive. So I get that. You know, it's, it's one of those things where people feel like they're saving money by doing things without permits. 
or same, saving some sort of hassle. Uh, most kitchen and bathroom rents do work. You know, it's only a few hundred bucks and the process is really simple. Yes, you're gonna have to hire a designer or somebody to put the plans together. So all in, you might be, you know, a few thousand dollars for that process, but from an insurance standpoint and uh, just a regulatory standpoint, you're really covering yourself and it's the smart thing to do. Um, I'm not saying that just to drum up work. I'm saying that because we get called in a lot to solve this kind of problem where people get in a situation that uh, they're dealing with unpermitted work. Okay, so I didn't mean to judge you on this. I'm just putting that out there for people who've considered this or are considering it. Okay, so you're already in that boat. Uh, we actually just got a call from somebody the other day. They had some unpermitted work. They were asking us, how do we fix this? They bought the property with the work that was done previously and it was not permitted, right? It wasn't any fault of theirs. They bought it knowing this, it was fully disclosed, and now they're trying to fix it. Um, so the short answer is these new laws really don't streamline the process of going back and getting that prior work approved. What they do, however, is make it more likely that what you've done will be approved because they're, they've relaxed a lot of the requirements, right? And depending on what you did, um, under the old regulations that might not have been allowed where now it might be, right? So the process to get this rectified is to hire a competent architect, um, have them come out, assess what you've done, document it, submit it to the local building official and, and get it reviewed and approved. The city or your county, whoever your uh, local jurisdiction is, will have varying requirements and penalties for getting permitted work approved. Um, in general, it's just a smart move. We run into cases a lot where, you know, someone does some unpermitted work and there's a fire and their insurance company won't cover the repair of what was there. They'll just take it back to, you know, the, the pre-existing conditions before that was done, or there's a, a cap on what, how much uh, code upgrades can be done. And now that beautiful ADU you had is just being reverted back to, you know, like a, a screened in porch. And, and that's a real world example that happened in one of our projects. It was uh, really sad. So get permits. It's not as hard as you think, um, especially if you have the right team. Okay, I think that is it. So um, just a big thank you to the people who submitted questions. We've got uh, Londervison Hunt 1, Red215100, Maggie eight by eight, uh, Marcos, Taylor, Jessica, and Adrian. So thanks so much for your questions. If you have any questions that we didn't answer, again, throw them in the comments below. We'll do some more of these videos. You're always welcome to call us or schedule an appointment, domum.design slash schedule. And of course our ADU plans are on shop.domum.design. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching this video today. Again, we really enjoy doing these. Uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. As I mentioned, we are a referral business and your support of what we do makes it all possible. So thanks so much. And until next time, I'm Tim Alatori, Principal Architect with Domum.